Hello, I'm Nate, aka B Tier Mutineer, and today, as part of my B Tier guides, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Instead of a character build for one of the companions in Dragon Age Origins, I'm going to take you through a build idea for your character, the Warden. This topic was requested by a viewer who mentioned that they had difficulty figuring out what to do with their own character sometimes, so I thought I'd give them some ideas. In total, I will be making three Warden build guides, one for each class. Today, I'm making a build guide for the Warrior. A caveat before we begin. I generally use the No Starting Abilities mod, which means I get to choose all the starting skills and abilities during character creation instead of getting some of them assigned automatically by the game. I highly recommend the No Starting Abilities mod because it enables you to make any build you want regardless of the origin story that gives you certain starting abilities. I think that having this freedom makes the game a lot more fun. I have, however, kept in mind which origin has which starting abilities, so if you're playing without this mod, no worries, I will be recommending the best origin that works with my build. I've tried to come up with builds that are different from the companion builds I recommend, so that your warden can feel unique. Without further ado, let's get into what I call the Slice and Dice Warrior. I decided to go with a dual wielding warrior build because dual wield warrior is my favorite build in Dragon Age Origins, and I'm forever sad that they removed dual wielding as an option for warriors in the later games. This is a damager build, so I recommend having a second warrior in your party to act as a tank. Up to you whether that's Alistair, Sten, or Shale. The origin that works best for this build is the City Elf, because they start with dual weapon sweep, as well as coercion and combat training. The Dwarven Commoner Warrior is a good second option, because they start out with dual weapon sweep, combat training, and stealing. Personally, I don't find stealing that good of a skill. As an Elf, you have a racial bonus of plus 2 to willpower and plus 2 to magic. Willpower is good for extra stamina, and magic is good so that healing poultices and spells are more effective on you. As a Dwarf, you get a racial bonus of plus 1 strength, plus 1 dexterity, plus 2 to constitution, and 10% chance to resist hostile magic. Arguably, the Dwarven racial bonuses are better, so you can choose whichever one of these two origin stories. But going forward, I will assume that you chose City Elf. When creating your character, you get 5 attribute points to spend. I recommend putting 2 points in Cunning to reach 12, 1 point in Dexterity to reach 14, and 2 points in Strength to reach 16. I recommend using your one skill point to either get an extra rank in combat training or one point in coercion. You will have dual weapon sweep already unlocked by default, so for your other two points I recommend getting dual weapon training and dual striking. Dual striking will be the main focus of our build, so I highly recommend activating it as soon as you have two weapons equipped. Even at a lower level you're going to do a lot more damage that way. During the City Elf Origin you have some useful items you can pick up. The Borrowed Longsword is a good early game weapon. The Denerim Guard Shield is a great shield for Alistair because it has a whopping 6 to defense and 4 missile deflection. Finally, Fencer's Cinch is a decent belt in the early game because it increases your attack. In the estate, you will also find both a leather armor set and a chainmail armor set. You can wear whichever one you prefer in the early game, but personally I tend to prefer medium armor in the early game because that extra armor does make a difference. In terms of which attributes to increase, my general advice is to put points in Strength and Dexterity. You will need a total of 36 Dexterity to unlock Dual Weapon Mastery, ideally at level 12 so that you can use full-size weapons in both hands as soon as possible. After that, you can put all of your remaining points in Strength to be able to equip higher tier weapons and armors as well as do more damage. Since you have 12 points in Cunning to start with, you really don't care about putting extra points in Cunning if you're going to get all of the bonus attribute points from the Fade, or if you have the Skip the Fade mod which gives you all of those bonus attribute points without you having to run around the whole Fade to get them. If for some reason you will not be getting those extra attributes from the Fade, then uh, you will eventually have to put an extra 4 points into Cunning to be able to max out Coercion and later Survival. During your early levels, you won't have access to high tier weapons and armor yet unless you count the DLC items, if you have those in your starting inventory. The best early swords have a max strength requirement of 15, which you already have at level 1, so you don't need to increase your strength until later on. So what I recommend you do is you put 2 points into dexterity and 1 point in strength whenever you level up, until you reach 36 dexterity. If you do this, you will reach 36 dexterity at level 11, just one level before dual weapon mastery becomes available. After level 11, feel free to put most of your points in strength, though I also recommend a few points in willpower here and there so that you have enough stamina to use your talents and to keep your sustained abilities active. I of course recommend maxing out the combat training skill first so that you have access to the highest tier of combat talents. However, if you are interested in using persuasion and intimidation a lot in your playthroughs, you can definitely afford to put an extra point in coercion during the early game, either during character creation or when you get your first level up that offers you a skill point. Just make sure to otherwise put points in combat training. 
Improved Coercion, the second rank of Coercion, will allow you to pass most checks that you can find in the early and mid game. In the mid game, after you've maxed out combat training, you can work on maxing out Coercion if you'd like. Other than these two skills, if you've watched my other build guides, you already know that I'm not a big fan of the crafting skills or of stealing, so that really just leaves survival. Personally, I find that survival gives your warden the most benefits and you can save the crafting skills for your companions. At most, you can get one point in poison making on your warden so that they can use poisons and grenades if you so desire, but my build assumes that you aren't using them. This build is a dual striking warrior build. The main elements that make this build shine are unlocking dual weapon mastery at level 12 so you can equip two full size weapons in both hands instead of a weapon and a dagger, having dual striking active at all times so that you do damage with both weapons at the same time, and the final piece of the puzzle is the momentum sustained which makes your dual striking auto attacks much faster so you become a slicing and dicing machine. Of course some of the other dual wielding and warrior talents are also useful, I will take you through all of the useful talents. From the warrior tree. Powerful, Bravery, and Death Blow are what we're interested in. This is a damage build, so we don't care about Threaten or Taunt. Powerful increases your health and reduces fatigue gain from armor. Bravery gives you bonuses to damage and physical and mental resistances. The critical chance bonus isn't something we're interested in because with dual striking we can't crit, but the other bonuses are great. Death Blow is awesome because whenever you kill an enemy, you restore some of your stamina, which means you can use your damaging abilities more often. From the dual weapon talents, here is what is good. The whole first row. You want to be able to unlock dual weapon mastery at level 12, as previously mentioned, so make sure that by level 11 you have dual weapon expert unlocked. All of these passives give you good bonuses for dual wielding, so there's no need to feel bad when you take them instead of an active ability during level ups. From the second row, you want dual striking, which you already have from character creation and which is our main way of attacking. Your character will be doing a lot of damage from auto attacks, but you can also use some of the activated abilities for extra damage and effects here and there. Repost is an amazing talent because it often succeeds at stunning enemies and it's quite a fast attack. Cripple is a great debuff because it can make the target have minus 40% movement speed, minus 10 to attack, and minus 10 to defense unless it passes a physical resistance check against your strength attribute. Dual weapon sweep is an area of effect attack that hits enemies in an arc in front of you. I love this talent, it's cheap and it does a lot of damage when you're fighting two or more enemies who are in front of you. But what's really amazing is Momentum, a sustained talent that increases your attack speed. The combination of momentum and dual striking is super satisfying and will make you deal a lot of damage with your auto attacks, especially with full one-handed weapons in each hand. There is a bug regarding attack speed, but only if you use both haste and momentum, however if you use the Dane's Fixes mod, the mod takes care of that problem. The only specialization you really care about as a lean mean slicing machine is Berserker, particularly the first three talents, Berserk and its two upgrades, Resilience and Constraint. Once you have Berserk, you'll definitely want to use it together with dual striking and momentum. The only thing to look out for is that your stamina regeneration might be too low in the beginning to be able to use all three together, so try it out to see if they work, and your stamina is able to stay put or regenerate. If your stamina regeneration is too low, then I recommend waiting until you unlock Constraint to use Berserk, as well as looking for gear that gives you a bonus to stamina regeneration in the meantime. Personally, I don't think that you need a second specialization during Origins, but if you really want one, you can choose between Champion and Templar. Champion you would want only for the Warcry talent so that you can debuff enemies around you, and if you take the Templar specialization, you're mainly interested in the Righteous Strike passive so that your very fast attacks drain mana from spellcasters. The other Templar talents are fine to get for utility, but not essential. The main things you're interested in when it comes to gear are good one-handed weapons that can deal a lot of damage, and items that give you stamina regeneration so that you're able to sustain dual striking, momentum, and berserk. Please do note that I will not mention items that are either very difficult to get or which you get extremely late in the game, as I want to be realistic about things and give you options that are actually viable for most of the game. For weapons, the best two weapon combination in my opinion has to be Duncan's Sword and Merrick's Blade, due to both swords having stamina regeneration, good damage, rune slots, and being able to be acquired decently early from the Return to Ostagar DLC. In my opinion, once you reach level 11, you can head to Ostagar since you will likely level up to 12 and unlock dual weapon mastery during your exploration of Ostagar, so you will be able to equip the swords pretty much as soon as you get them. Duncan's Sword has bonuses to willpower, cunning, stamina regeneration, and damage versus darkspawn. The bonuses to willpower and stamina regeneration are the most important, but the damage versus darkspawn is also relevant. They are the main enemy we face throughout the game after all. Merrick's Blade has bonuses to health regeneration, stamina regeneration, damage versus darkspawn, as well as the weakens nearby darkspawn property. In the base game, the weakens darkspawn property doesn't do anything, unfortunately, but if you have Dane's fixes, it implements this property and it works. 
Again, the stamina regeneration is great, and the health regeneration and damage versus dark spawn are nothing to scoff at. There are some other decent weapons, however, especially if you want to wait a bit before doing Return to Ostagar, or you want to use one of the swords on another character. Very early game, you will have the Borrowed Longsword, which is fine enough to use since it has bonuses to attack and armor penetration. Another good early game sword to replace a Borrowed Longsword with is the Oathkeeper. It has better damage, extra armor penetration, a rune slot, and a bonus to healing effects received. However, the healing effects received property is bugged and you will need to use Dane's fixes if you wanted to actually do something. Having a rune slot so early is pretty great. A pretty good late game weapon to replace one of the swords if absolutely necessary is Starfang, the longsword version. It is a sword you can craft at Soldier's Peak. It has bonuses to dexterity, damage, and armor penetration. It is a great sword in terms of damage, but you aren't getting anything to help you with stamina regeneration and will have to make up for it somewhere else in your gear. Early on, before level 12, you will also be using a dagger in your offhand, so here are some good early game daggers. Obviously, I'm not going to bother mentioning the most expensive or difficult to acquire daggers, since from level 12 onwards you will want to replace your dagger with a full-sized weapon. You can purchase the tier 2 Thorn of the Dead Gods dagger from Barlin in the Lothering Tavern. It has extra damage and armor penetration. It's not very expensive, so if for some reason you don't have access to the other daggers I'm mentioning here, it is a good upgrade to the basic dagger that you will likely have at that point, and it will tide you over until a better option becomes available. Olaf's Prized Cheese Knife is a DLC dagger you can get from Honleith. It has good damage, two rune slots, and plus one to armor penetration. It's a good dagger if you're waiting to go later to Oscar. The Edge is an amazing DLC item, one of the best daggers in the game in my opinion. Due to the fact that it has a plus five to damage, it ends up having a damage output similar to many longswords in the game. However, it doesn't have many other stats, just a bit of crit chance, which is useless for this build, and plus four to attack. In terms of raw damage, however, it is the closest you get to a full-sized weapon so early in the game. In terms of runes, I recommend using elemental runes since those are effective against enemies of all types. Lightning runes are the best because lightning damage drains stamina from non-mage enemies and lightning damage is also rarely resisted. Fire runes are second best since darkspawn, undead, and sylvans are weak against it and you will fight a lot of darkspawn and quite a lot of undead too. So lightning and fire runes are the best ones. A bonus useful rune to add to your weapons that doesn't do damage but has good utility is a paralyzed rune. You will be attacking at a high speed and if you have a paralyzed rune in your weapons, each attack has a chance to paralyze the enemy. You only need one paralyzed rune in each weapon at most, but you can also do just fine with a single paralyzed rune in your main sword. You can loot a Grandmaster Flame Rune from the High Dragon during the Urn of Sacred Ashes, as well as purchase one from the Wonders of Theta's shop in Denrim. Master Flame Runes are randomly looted. In terms of Lightning Runes, you can buy both a Grandmaster and Master Lightning Rune from Bodan and the Party Camp. In terms of Paralyzed Runes, a Grandmaster Paralyzed Rune can be looted from Colgrim during the Urn of Sacred Ashes quest, and another can be bought from the Wonders of Thedas in Denerim. There is also an Expert Paralyzed Rune for sale at the Wonders of Thedas shop. In terms of armor, I recommend using either light or heavy pieces. Massive armor has too much fatigue and your character isn't a tank, so there is no need for the extra armor points that massive armor gives you. Medium armor is unfortunately very much underutilized in Dragon Age Origins and there's just not very good options. Here are some good chest pieces. Battle Dress of the Provocateur is a light chest piece that you can unlock by getting an achievement in the Liliana Song DLC. It truly is an amazing chest piece. Dexterity, armor, chance to dodge, stamina regeneration, and stamina. Following that, the Felon's Coat is another amazing light chest piece. Dexterity, defense, armor, stamina regeneration, and physical resistance but it is only available to purchase from Heren after you complete three main quests. Shadow of the Empire is a decent light chess piece, giving bonuses to strength, dexterity, and stamina regeneration. I recommend it in case you don't have a lot of money during your playthrough since it still offers you some good stats that are useful for your build. In terms of heavy armor, I recommend Wade's Superior Heavy Dragon Scale Set with Yvonne the Great's Mail replacing the regular Wade's chess piece because Yvonne's Mail has amazing stats. Health regen, armor, chance to dodge, stamina regen, and defense against missiles. As always, remember that Yvonne's Mail is only available to purchase from Heren after you finish three main quests, so only commission one set of Drake Scale armor before you purchase Yvonne's Mail. Once you've commissioned the second set of Drake Scale armor from Wade, Heren will refuse to trade with you. This is also relevant in regards to the Felon's Coat, since it is also only available in Heren's Replenish stock. In terms of helmets, here are the good ones. The Long Runner's Cap is a good light helmet that gives a bonus to stamina regen. You can get it in the Carta Hideout from Killing Jarvia and from the Jammer's Stash Quest. The Executioner's Helm is a heavy helmet with plus 25 to stamina. 
Personally, I prefer the bonus to Stamina Regen, but it takes a while to get to Orzammar, so until then you can use this helmet. The Helm of Hanli is one of the best helmets in the game, one of the most powerful items that are quite contested among your characters. It gives plus 2 to all attributes and plus 3 to armor. It's a DLC item that you can get from the Hanli village. If you aren't using Wade Set, then here are some good gloves. The Kunari Siege Gauntlets have a bonus to armor penetration, and you can loot them from the High Dragon during the Urn of Sacred Ashes quest. Wade's Superior Drakeskin Gloves from the set made out of Drake Scales is also decent, offering dexterity and fire resistance. And finally, if you are just looking for a cheap alternative that offers some kind of bonus, the Dalish Gloves give a bonus of plus one to dexterity. You can easily get them from the Dalish camp if you purchase them from Barathorn, or find them as random loot around the Brazilian forest. Similarly, if you aren't using Wade's set, here are some good boot options. The Bard's Dancing Shoes are light boots that give you plus 6 to defense and reduce hostility. The reduce hostility property is only active if you have Dane's fixes, otherwise it isn't implemented. These can be purchased from Bodan in the party camp. The Lion's Paw are a DLC item. They are some of the best boots in the game, even though they're light, because they have armor, chance to dodge, and chance to avoid missiles. Finally, the Boots of Diligence are heavy boots that give plus 6 to defense and plus 2 to armor. They are sold by Owen in Redcliffe Village if you saved his daughter. In terms of accessories, there are of course the highly contested ones that I generally don't recommend because it's up to you whether you have them, can afford them, and who you want to equip them on. Andrew's Blessing and the Cinch of Skillful Maneuvering Belts, the Spell Ward and High Regard of House Dace Amulets, and the Life Giver, Key to the City, and Ring of Ages Rings. Due to this being a main character build, however, I will mention where some of the contested items would be useful for this build because, well, I imagine that if you're going to equip someone with the best items, it will be your main character. In terms of belts, I do find that Andrew's Blessing would be really good here, but it is extremely expensive, so I understand if you cannot afford to buy it. The Dalish Hunter's Belt is a good option for the Stamina Regeneration. If you feel that you have enough Stamina Regeneration from other gear, the Cinch of Skillful Maneuvering or the Sword Belt are also some good alternatives. For Amulets, the Mark of Vigilance DLC Amulet is pretty good for defense. Magister's Shield is an even better version that you can get in the Deserted Building in Denerim. Pearl of the Anointed gives plus one to all attributes, so it's also a decent option. For rings, here are the good ones. The Dawn Ring is good for the extra strength. The Harvest Festival Ring is great, giving strength, dexterity, and attack. It's a DLC item found in Hanleith Village. Ring of the Warrior also gives plus two to strength and dexterity, and it is found during the Drifter's Cash Quest in the Deep Roads. Key to the City would also be quite good here. It gives plus two to all attributes, so it's essentially just as good as the Harvest Festival Ring and Ring of the Warrior in terms of attributes, and even better since it also gives you bonuses to all of the other attributes. But you will be hard pressed to find a build that doesn't like Key to the City. Finally, the Lucky Stone is a decent DLC ring that gives plus one to all attributes. I've already essentially explained the strategy at play here. You have dual striking, momentum, and berserk active, and you do a lot of damage with your auto attacks, while occasionally using some of your other abilities for extra damage and effects. Other than this, you will want to keep an eye on your health and use health poultices when you're low or get a mage to heal you. Remember that this build works best if you have a tank warrior in your party to draw most of the aggression of the enemies while you get to slice them to bits. I also highly recommend having a mage who can heal you and your other allies, as well as providing damage from afar. The fourth party member can be anyone you want. Another tank, another mage, a rogue, another damager, even the dog. You'll be doing so much damage that the fourth party member doesn't matter all that much. This was a bit of a longer video than usual, but I wanted to give a very thorough explanation of how this build works, because as far as I know, it's not a very common build. I hope you enjoyed this character build idea for the Warden in Dragon Age Origins. If you're looking forward to seeing more of my Dragon Age videos, as well as occasionally some videos on other RPGs, do remember to subscribe and leave a like and comment while you're at it too. This has been B-Tier Mutineer. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.